welcome to Sister Power. Women today are doing more than ever and deserve recognition. Your vibe attracts your tribe. The power of sisterhood is our topic for this episode. And joining the conversation is Crystal Quap, director and producer, Blurring the Color Line documentary, and Sequoia Carr Brown, owner of Strange Fruit Express. Welcome, ladies. Hello. Hey, hello. Welcome back, I should say. Yeah. Yes. You know, <laughs> it, your vibe attracts your tribe is such a hot topic in today's world. And sisterhood is another hot topic in this world. And I just want, uh, starting with Crystal and then Sequoia, tell our Sister Power viewers all the wonderful, thriving things that you are doing. It's all about vibing and thriving. Crystal. I like that. Vibing and thriving. I feel like we should be doing a little dance on that. <laughs> um, yes. So hello, everyone. Um, I just want to tell you a little bit about my film because that's really what's consuming. It has been consuming my life for the last five years that I created this documentary that is really intended to disrupt racial narratives. And when I say that, I mean it because when I um, first moved back to the States after being in Hong Kong for many years, I really realized that everything here, obviously around the racial narrative is based on a very black and white divide right? Very binary way of looking at things. And so I got to thinking about um, why, why are we so binary? Why It's not a black and white world out there. You know, there are many uh, colors in the spectrum. And uh, speaking to my personal experience, uh, my grandmother grew up in the deep south, uh, Augusta, Georgia, to be specific. And this was in the 30s. And I just started thinking about, wow, what is an Asian girl, a very traditional Chinese girl, how does she grow up in the Black neighborhood of the segregated South, uh, navigating both the racialized structure at the time, as well as a very strong patriarchal system because of the Chinese traditional ways of, of, of parenting. And so these kind of uh, double pressure systems, how does that affect a woman uh, growing up and how does that shape her perceptions on uh, race relations and herself as a woman? And so that's how I started to dig into the idea of um, Chinese growing up in the Deep South, disrupting racial narratives. And uh, boy, I'm telling you, you know how when you open up something, you don't realize how it's just the tip of the iceberg. This whole race relation story it became way bigger than I thought it would be. And um, it's, it's, it's opened up to speak to the, the recent troubling aspects that I hope we can converse about today, which is the Afro-Asian tensions, but solidarity. I want to say it's both, right? Because sometimes media likes to frame it as if it were just a, an animosity that's deeply rooted in these kind of pitting against each other type of stories. But at the same time, uh, we've had a very connective history. Uh, and it, it's very interesting. And I think it illuminates a lot of uh, things that we don't see or learn in history. So um, I'm hoping this conversation today, back to your theme of Vibe and Tribe, is that through sisterhood, through women's voices, because I do focus on the women's voices, how do intimate histories reveal a deeper history? I think that's something that women come together and we have these kind of like intimate conversations. And some people in the male dominated world will dismiss it as being something petty, but they have no idea the depth and the richness that comes out of a sisterhood conversation. And I think that's why I, I commend you for having the space for us to talk like this. So I'm just going to leave it there for now. And I just want to say, yes, my film is in the festival circuit route now. It's going to different places. It has been going to different places. I'm very happy how it's been received. Um, and we are going to be doing another event here in Hawaii, the three of us. So we can talk about that a little bit later, too. I hope that's a good way to kind of tease out what I'm doing. Thank you. I like, I like that teaser. All right, vibing and thriving, Sequoia. Yeah, I'm going to kind of just pick up from what Crystal was saying in terms of the historical uh, significance of our community's uh, 
AAPI and African American communities in solidarity. Uh, the media indeed uh, tends to divide us. You know, it's divide, division makes money, hate, big money and hate, right? But the real true story that isn't told is that we've always been uh, united. There's been times of animus, but uh, dating as far back as what the uh, 1860s, like 1869, Frederick Douglass was a strong advocate for um, uh, advocating for Chinese migrants, right? He has a famous speech called the Composite Nation. And his whole concept of like, you know, equality and justice for all, uh, free migration, right? And there's been a thread of that throughout the African American community in terms of anyone coming, migrating in, uh, in terms of uh, Asian, AAPI, you have like, you know, you have, what was it, 1889 was the Chinese Exclusion Act? 1882, yeah. 82, okay, thank you. And I know that that time period, the 1880s, there's a lot going on and overlapping with Jim Crow. So we both of these communities are, you know, seeing that, you know, we have some interconnections here. And I think that the white social structure, constructed white social structure, likes to pit us against one another to help keep that power. Because when they see that when we are united, that that their uh, their constructs will fall, right? So my work at Strange Fruit Express kind of brings in these elements, community-based co collaborative uh, concepts. And I, I bring forth our history, those unsung heroes, those narratives that are swept to the wayside. And I use the arts to bring them up, uh, to lift them, to lift those voices, women, people of color in particular. I use dance, I use uh, fine art, through art installations and all kinds of projects. So I'm really, really excited to uh, be collaborating with Crystal and you, Sharon, to bring uh, this story forward and uh, talk about it. It needs to be spoken of. Yeah, talking about vibing and thriving, you know, the three of us were together in the studio with Crystal and we had such a unique conversation. I have some pictures of us, I think, in the studio. But, you know, later on, in September 10th, Sisters in Park Hawaii, along with Strange Fruit Express, is um, one of the sponsors. And we're doing Your Vibe Attract Your Tribe, September 10th. And it, this is such a um, unique way of women coming together at the um, Outrigger Canoe Club. And I'm so excited about that. You know, sisterhood is a bond between women who share common goals. So I'm going to ask you this question, um, Crystal. What is the historical significance of Afro and Asian solidarity? Okay, well, you know, picking backing off of Sequoia's uh, mention of the historical 1882 um, Exclusion Act, which really was a pivotal and the first and only real uh, legal uh, policy that forbade Chinese people coming over based on their race. And um, so that kind of like is the opening conversation of the Chinese immigration story in that sense of the racism against um, uh, Chinese. But so in my, my particular research is that um, many people from China went to San Francisco as first immigrants, and then eventually some of them trickled over to different parts of the country to right make, make a living. And um, they entered the black neighborhoods of the segregated South because the white people didn't want to do business with black people back then after the plantation life kind of fizzled out. And so there was a very interesting dynamic between the two cultures. And when we talked earlier about the both tension and um, friendships that kind of worked together because there is a power structure, right? The Chinese were the storekeepers. They, they held the purse and they made money off of black people in the neighborhood. At the same time, some people claim it was a symbiotic relationship because they needed each other to make the system work, but it's complicated, right? It's like, um, again, to Sequoia saying about how media frames us pitting each other, uh, us against each other, is that how do, how do these, this past 
how does this inform us today of these pre-existing kind of discriminations against each other? You know, where does it come from? And we don't think about the past informing uh, these tensions today because we just want to build our own narrative over, um, okay, well, that case, oh, that violent case, that was because of the so-and-so, you know, um, it just, um, we, we want to tell the stories we want to hear. And I think that's, um, that's, a, that's a weak way. It's harder to make the effort to understand each other's history. For example, I, in my film, I did not, when I interviewed this, uh, this uh, longtime resident in, in Georgia, I didn't think about if I were a black person as a mother, I wouldn't have to worry about. So if I, as I was a Chinese, sorry, I wouldn't have to worry about my kids and the dangers of letting them go out and confronting police. Whereas if you were a black mother, and we talked about this before, and that type of fear and the way you have to educate your children, I didn't think about these things before. And so this ignorance gives me that kind of urge to need to grow out of my comfort zone of what I don't know. And we need to know about each other's cultures. We need to be in each other's seats to really empathize and to really figure out why we have these tensions. Yeah. Now, you know, you did bring, I'm glad you did bring that up because just yesterday, uh, the policeman, 2 a.m. in the morning, opened the door and shot and killed this young black man. He didn't know who was at the door. Breonna Taylor was asleep in her bed and she was murdered by the policeman. Yes, these are the conversations black mothers and black fathers have with our children and on a daily basis. You know, you just have rules that you, because you, because you want your children to come home alive. You know, our children are our are, are heartbeats. Well, let me come to you, Sequoia. Um, how does being open to community-based ideas attract like-minded individuals to your tribe? Uh, a lot of it has to do with being uh, forthright um, and honest about who you are as a person, I think. Uh, I find it works well for me. And, uh, you know, you attend uh, events or you find projects where like-minded people uh, will be, right? Where you develop this kind of a kinship, right? And um, you can't close your mind to assuming or presuming that because they don't, someone doesn't look like you, that they don't uh, respect you or value who you are. Uh, took me a while to learn how to navigate those waters because you can make, as Crystal mentioned, you can make assumptions and presume, you know, uh, that, you know, make general sweeping uh, uh, observations, if you will, that everyone that is white or AAPI is racist against you or all the police are, are going to kill you. You know, you have to have a certain uh, peace within your own mind, body, and spirit, have them all aligned, and that you send out a vibe. I, I can't explain it better than just knowing that this vibe, this energy, if you will, will exude from you, and you will attract the right people to you. Now, at the same time, when you're positive, like this basic science, you're like this negative uh, negative force, if you will, will try to come in, but you're able to recognize them and shun them off. Like I, I think Sharon and I, we've discussed this, you know, in terms of dealing and navigating through uh, racism in certain spaces. You can read somebody before they even approach you. You already know that they're going to try to attack you in a negative way. So you learn how to navigate through those, you know, those situations. So I find that overall being positive, knowing who you are as a woman, as in your culture, having pride in that, I think your energy will attract the right people to you and you go to the right events, have discussions, be open, and um, your, your tribe will manifest. And I think that that energy, you know, Sequoia, you're onto something. It's, it's really about energy and that's something that you have to 
to develop, you have to work on, Yeah, you know, you, of course, people will have different energies, but then that positive energy comes from your value system, your core values, and the way you embrace life and things around you, and it really yeah. manifests. You don't have to speak and you'll know if something yeah. is exuding, like you said, positive or negative energy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's not about everyone being looking the same. You know, not a lot of people kind of think that tribe means primitive or you have to be all the same yeah. culture and ethnic ethnic group, but not necessarily, right? It's, a, it's that energy, it's that flow. And when you find it and you feel it, you know it. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah, my girlfriend used to say, I heard you when you drove up. <laughs> that vibe is there. And, you, it, it, and it comes with wisdom, too. Yes. Definitely comes with wisdom. So, Crystal, let's discuss why your tribe matters, accountability, fulfillment. Why does your tribe matter? Well, I'm going to take it back to, like, you know, g- Chinese culture is a collective society and um, for better or for worse. Okay. I'm going to say that because um, on one hand, it's great. We all work together collectively to, to have a certain image of pride, but at the same time, it doesn't give room for individuality where people can shine with their own specific ways of thinking. Right. But um, I think that when I think tribe, I think of the positive aspect of that is that we learn from that. You know, a lot of younger generation, and I'm not trying to um, critique the whole younger generation, but I find that a lot of people don't have that collective way of doing things now. There is something missing. And that is why there are so many problems out there because people are doing things for themselves and not thinking for for uh, of, like the village mentality is a beautiful thing back in the days, whether it was a China and Africa or, you know, wherever in the world, you work as a team because it, it builds your own life in such a richer way. And I've, I think we've lost that. We need to regroup. We need to find that that sense of power, you know. Well, we used to say it takes a, tr- it takes a village. Yeah. You know who said that too in my film? James Brown's uh, daughter, Deanna Brown, who I had the privilege of interviewing, she was saying because uh, the, uh, James Brown works as a, an errand boy for some of the grocery stores. And she says, you know, they all don't have to look the same, but, you know, it takes a village. And it was just a beautiful way of consolidating it. Oh, great. So true. So true. You know, vibes are just, it, it's, it's an emotional segment in our being, in our core our vibes. And so what you put out is what you get. And Sequoia, I want to ask you, are there, excuse me, other organizations working to unite Black, Indigenous, and people of color? Oh, very much so. Uh, We have uh, the Asian American uh, Advancing Justice, that's AAJC.org. So that's more on the domestic front. Um, they are very active in bringing the communities together, understanding one another, various projects to uh, inform the community. And, uh, and then we have on that tour of a, on an international front, it's uh, the Asian, Afro-Asian People Solidarity Organization, and that's A-A-P-S-O-R-G dot org. And that's more like, like over 90 countries. So, you know, this this anti-Blackness or this uh, uh, concept of divide and conquer AAPI against uh, the African diasporic peoples, it's an international kind of vibe here, right? Negative vibe. But um, so we have, you know, we have to fight it on so many fronts, not only like in the interior, amongst within our own circles, then domestically within our country, and then it spans out internationally unfortunately, but there are organizations home and away who are working to uh, resolve that and to dispel that that old colonial myth that you have to divide everyone up and bring in countries that have been colonized to, uh, to indoctrinate them with constructed state of whiteness to become anti-Black or to even just to, um, to not even uh, love their own culture and take, you know, not use their own language and feel shame, right? So um, I just love that the African-Americans have always been there. Um, I wish more would be there for us. 
uh, from Frederick Douglass on to like uh, both uh, colonial wars, what Vietnam and Korea War, right? Uh, there are African Americans who are fighting and standing up uh, against that. Um, the black soldiers of the Philippines, like the Philippine American War, mm -hmm. right? They deserted, right? Yeah. And they fought with the Liberation Front in the Philippines, right? So, uh, and even with Vietnam, you had MLK, Malcolm X, and uh, Muhammad Ali. Yeah, Spoke yeah. Against that, you know, you know. You know, actually, you're giving me ideas. You know, what you're saying now is this kind of cross pollination of cultures because of our historical way, the colonized world, and how we've been forced into situations that kind of bring us together, mm -hmm. right? Militarism has, uh, you know, brought together the experience of Filipinos and the Americans and and the, and the Black soldiers. But it makes you think about this blurring space. Speaking to you know the title of my film, what does it mean to blur? And a lot of times, I feel like. Um, to mix the in-between spaces. Like there, there are some young, wonderful uh, young people out there doing great work now. I just learned about this one. She's half Korean, half black. And you know how there's that whole controversy about the hair shops with the Korean hair store owners and right? Mm -hmm. She owns a hair store, but she's also an artist and she uses the idea of the hair weaving into her art, making like amazing chandeliers. And her embodiment of being of mixed culture, she feels compelled to 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 bring together these conversations. So I think, you know, it's hopeful while the mate the, the dominant narrative is dismissing these smaller stories. There are some gems of yeah. people doing things that blend spaces that show the beauty of this combination and of how we can work together with different cultures, even though we were supposedly on other each other's sides of the you know spectrum, which is kind of a silly concept. We really are blending our spaces like we are here to talk about really the positive connectivities as opposed to pushing us aside. Yeah, and and come to you. Know, we're talking about the bond of sisterhood. I'm excited about February the 9th, 2023, and we want our audience to know that we're going to blend the cultures at Jade Dynasty, and it's going to be about we're going to have a deep conversation of blurring the color line. So Sequoia, let's talk about that day that Thursday that's coming up. Yeah, it's gonna be fantastic. I'm so excited because we are blending not only it's uh, Chinese New Year, it's African American History Month, right? So again, blurring those color lines, showing that we are uh, more alike and connected than unalike, right? And bringing uh, entertainment and conversation, the screening of the uh, documentary, having a, a real heart to heart, deep, profound talk with activities to kind of engage the audience, to get to know one another, right? And to see how we can move forward and press as a united front of people, BIPOC, you know, working against the colonial mindsets and um, kind of just, you know, decolonizing ourselves, mind, body, and spirit. I'm loving it, I'm so excited. Yeah, and going to that vibe, um, you know, we're we're utilizing through food as a wonderful, fun, engaging way to bring us together too, culturally. Yeah. And I'm working with a J Dynasty menu, and it's so fun to think about what are the connective ingredients that bring our histories together and to think about, you know, like in my film, I talk about, I interview people and they say they remembered eating pickled pig feet a lot in the in the past. And so was that a southern thing? Because, you know, Asians ate that too. Um, and it's so interesting to hear our blended history through food. So we're going to really kind of utilize that as a fun way in to engage in these kind of uh, conversations about our past. That when people attend this event, February the 9th, 2023, and we did uh, deeper conversations and discussions, that we have far more in common than not. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know, we all believe the same. We have emotions, we cry, we celebrate, we're happy for one another. And, you know, we have maybe four minutes left, Sequoia and Crystal, and I'll start with you, Sequoia. Let's, I want you to speak to the camera and motivate, educate, and empower all of our listeners. I want you all to know that you are beautiful people. We are a united front. 
of global citizens that are working to develop our mind, body, and spirit in a positive way to see that we are all more alike than unalike. We have much to learn from one another. And when you hear something negative against someone that you don't even know yet, that's a trope, cliche, shun it away and learn for yourself what is going on. Learn one another's history. It's a very rich history. It's not centered to just one particular group that conquered or colonized of people. We are all have something that have contributed to the history of this world and made wonderful, beautiful culture. So embrace that, enjoy that, and I'll see you along the trail. Oh, that's so beautiful. <laughs> yeah. Yay! Take us out. Man, she said it all. Uh, well, just, uh, you know, because I also teach a course in women and film at UH, and I talk to my students, and I think about going back to questioning things, to never take things as face value, because there's, a con there's always a context to how something's framed. And I think we need to be critical um, learners, and you don't have to be in school to do this. We are, as we uh, embrace, when we look at social media, for example, all this bombardment of information to really be, have a critical view of who's framing something and what, who, who's setting the standard for what um, defines us. And we need to disrupt that. We need to resist these kind of um, so-called normative ways of thinking because it's not true. Uh, we, are, we are sucked into this very binary world and to complicate it. And that's what that we sisterhood thing does too. We complicate the narrative because all these little nuanced stories that we all individually offer as a collective become such a powerful thing that we have no idea how much energy and power we can contribute to making change. And I think we all need to believe in ourselves to do that. Um, and that's just what I want to leave with y'all. Yeah. I am because we are. Woo <laughs> I'm loving this conversation. And I want to remind everyone that September 10th, Your Vibe Attracts Your Tribe will be happening at the Outrigger Canoe Club. And I want to remind you for February the 9th, 2023, Jade's uh, Dynasty, we're having Blurring the Line, a deep conversation. Thank you, Sequoia Carr Brown. Thank you, Krista Pop, for your expertise and your knowledge and your beautiful smile. <laughs> I'm your host, Sharon Thomas Yarbrough, and I want to leave you with this. Choose to live within your purpose. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.